All right, so according to my watch, we're two seconds early, but I think, I think time will forgive us. Um, so into our final talk before lightning talks now. Uh, see, I remember to finally show them at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> We have John, uh, who is 50% uh, of Secret Lab is, I believe, his Twitter bio, who's a game development company. Uh, he's going to be talking about the work he's done, well, I assume that's what he's going to be talking about, because that's what his abstract said, uh, about the work he's been doing as part of some of his indie game dev work. So please join me in thanking our final speaker for the day, John. Hello everyone. Um, thank you very much for that wonderful intro, Tim. Uh, I'm John Manning, uh, and today we'll be talking about how uh, we have worked with the open source process as part of the, the development of some independent video games. So the standard scene setting slides now follow. Um, I am 50% of Secret Lab. We are based down in Hobart. We make uh, primarily mobile focused um, indie games and also just a bit of contract work too. We are also authors of books as well. Um, so we've written a whole bunch of books for O'Reilly Media. You know those books with the animals on the cover. So they've done pretty well, I think. And in fact, our most recent book is a book called Mobile Game Dev with Unity. Uh, this is a shameless plug. Please buy my book. Um, we also have made a few games for some very interesting people. Uh, we made a game for the National Museum of Australia um, called, appropriately, The Museum Game, um, which is like a board game that you uh, use by running around the, uh, uh, the ground floor of um, the museum, taking photos of their exhibits and um, competing with other teams who are doing the same thing. We also made a children's game for Qantas, which was a lot of fun um, because the goal of the game there was not to produce some amazing, you know, gripping high revenue entertainment, but rather pr produce a toy that children could use to distract themselves on planes. We're also in the middle of um, a couple of unreleased, uh, um, vaguely unannounced games. Uh, this one is a, a game in which you drop a gnome down a well on a rope. Um, and also a game um, about uh, the life and times of Leonardo da Vinci, um, who, yeah, we're really excited about that, that one. Now, Today, I'm going to be talking about two main points in the area of open source and indie games. How to work with open source processes without impacting your game development too much, and also how to engage with game developers as someone who works in open source. So this talk is kind of for both people who are uh, either currently doing indie game dev work or want to, um, as well as people who uh, want to support independent game developers maybe by like, getting them to work on your open source project or get contributions. So the most recent released uh, title that I worked on is a game called Night in the Woods. So who here has heard of, played, or otherwise known about Night in the Woods? Yay, that's awesome. Um, so for the half of you who didn't raise your hands, Night in the Woods is a game that came out in February last year, and uh, it was received pretty well. Um, so, we're, I mean, we're up for a whole bunch of awards, so that's cool and nerve-wracking. Um, it was developed by a team called Infinite Fall and published by a company called Finji. Uh, Finji uh, is probably best known for being uh, started by the person who made Cannabolt. Cannabolt is the game that kind of started the whole revolution of uh, Infinite Runners. So, very cool thing. So, in Night in the Woods, you play this cat. Her name is May. She has just dropped out of college. She uh, moves back to her family uh, and her hometown in the Rust Belt, so basically somewhere in, somewhere in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and she finds that uh, all of her friends and, st and such have moved on with their lives while she very much has not. Um, it is an extremely narrative-focused game. Most of the gameplay uh, is talking to other people, a little bit of exploration as well. Also, you beat up cars with a baseball bat and play bass guitar. Um, the game engine runs through a system called Yarn. Um, now, I think some people here have already done some stuff in Yarn. Could you raise your hands if you have? A few of you? Yeah, one or two. Yeah. Um, so, Yarn is a system designed for managing dialogue content in games. Yarn is a uh, language and editor um, used. A, Originally written for Night in the Woods, and this is actually a screenshot of some of the source code to Night in the Woods, and I'll show you some more uh, of the dialogue uh, as we progress. Now, Yarn, when it first was developed, was done by uh, the terribly busy and terribly overworked um, Alec Haloka, who was the original programmer on Night in the Woods, and the main programmer from start to finish, and he also wrote all the music too. So this is somebody who has a lot of time on his hands, clearly. 
Um, he built and released this editor and said, maybe somebody can do something with this. I don't really know. Anyway, back to work. Um, I found it, and, uh, and because I had plenty of t free time on my hands, as we of course all do, um, I made a, a slightly more improved version, which I called Yarn Spinner. And Yarn Spinner, I released under an, an, an MIT license, and the whole thing got picked up and uh, ended up being merged into the uh, Night in the Woods code base, and I actually ended up joining the team, um, which was great fun. Now, the Yarn language itself it was originally designed so that the writer of the game, who was also the game's artist, a guy named Scott Benson, um, most of his dialogue writing was done in a cafe on pen and paper. He's not a Luddite by any means, but he just found that was his process and he, he liked it quite a lot. So most of his time was spent writing pen and paper dialogue, which he would then transfer into a text file. Yarn was designed to facilitate that workflow. Because when you have nothing more than uh, just lines of dialogue, and you don't, you don't want to have to spend time processing that into some uh, complicated scripting format. So this is what Yarn looks like. This is a uh, screenshot of some of the code uh, that uh, for one of the first conversations you have in the game. This is where uh, May arrives home uh, for the first time in the game and uh, has a brief conversation uh, with uh, her, her mother. Oh, actually, no, this is actually the morning after, but that's just a detail. So you can see how the dialogue system is designed for um, simplicity. This is something that someone who doesn't know a huge amount of programming uh, can very easily get a lot of stuff out of. Um, the whole thing was designed around uh, the, the system called Twine, which was mentioned earlier today. Uh, Twine was designed to be a tool for quickly and easily writing interactive fiction content for the web. And the syntax was actually so nice and easy to use that um, the whole thing was adopted. Because So what, what control structures and syntax do, does exist is almost directly lifted from Twine. So Yarn is used to drive just about everything in Night in the Woods. Um, every conversation that you have is um, run through Yarn, but also a lot more. So the Yarn editor is smart enough to be able to detect the links between nodes of dialogue in the game, and then it presents it as a flow diagram that you can very easily read. So you can very quickly and easily uh, understand how the game flows together. So looking at a bit of a closer thing, this is the same uh, piece of uh, content. This is uh, May talking to her mother. You can see how we have these chunks of... Um, these chunks of dialogue all linked together in nodes. Now, what's particularly cool about the Yarn language that ended up being developed over the course of the game, and this is actually done in public as well, is that um, the Yarn language allows for branching dialogue in a way that doesn't require you to create a node-based approach. You don't have to create two nodes then formally link them together with an edge on the graph and things like that. Um, in fact, all you have to do is just add in a little arrow symbol with a hyphen and a dash, indent, and now you have a whole branch. So it's very easy both to write branching dialogue but also to read. So you can look at this and you can very easily see that, uh, that there are two options after that line where May says, um, there's two. Uh, so most of the uh, dialogue options that if you were here while Tim was playing Night in the Woods earlier, you saw options appearing in, in the speech bubbles, that was being driven by this system. So tremendously uh, powerful for writing branching uh, narrative. One other thing that Jan is very good at doing though is managing game state. Most of Night in the Woods is written in Yarn, and that includes all the code that changes the game's current state, where the player is, what the state of other characters are, how they feel about it, all the variables that run through Yarn. So we can see here, for example, based on uh, certain conditions, we run certain other code, we set certain variables, and in fact, every time a level loads, Yarn is told to run a very particular uh, node called init level. This is actually uh, init level for one of the hub areas of the game. And so we do a whole bunch of tests to see if, if this is act zero and day zero, then um, we do a whole bunch of setup work. So you know, we show a couple of characters, Donna and Greg. We make Greg um, uh, sit down and also uh, be looking at, um, uh, at a certain object in the game. Um, I'm not going to explain what is going on in here because it's actually spoilers. Um, but yeah, so basically the game was written in Yarn and then the rest of the game's Unity engine was written as a shell around that to provide support for Yarn. So yeah, really, really cool system. Um, and the whole thing worked fairly well. Um, we uh, di didn't really run into to a huge number of, uh, of issues. There were always occasional uh, glitches in the compiler, which um, was only the second compiler I've ever written in my life. Um, so yeah, 
It was pretty cool. So Yarn Spinner was released as open source under the MIT license, as I mentioned, from the get-go. That meant that all that work was done in public. Um, any features that were added were done as, uh, as per the requirements of the game. So um, when Alec told me that, that he needed a certain feature, for example, tagging certain lines for localization, then that just got merged into mainline. So you can find the project at lab.2 slash yarn spinner. There's a dash between the words yarn and spinner. Um, this is just a GitHub project. I'm just using a nice fancy URL shortener. Um, and also because of analytics. Um, <laughs> Now, there are a number of reasons why open source was a tremendously good fit for this project. And a lot of them are the reasons why you know that open source is great. That is, community contributions are a great thing. It allows for easier modifications. You, you provide longevity for the project. These are the things that you already know as open source software developers. So I'm kind of preaching to the choir here because there's a whole bunch of other people here who uh, aren't necessarily in the open source community, and that is very busy independent game developers. So here's why open source matters for these people. Free code. Right, which is a totally valid reason. Like, you're really busy as an indie dev, and so any time you can save is fantastic. But what that means is, and this is based on a number of conversations that I've had with um, both open source people who know about game dev and game dev people who know about open source and people who don't know about either, you know, like one, or the, one but not the other. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that people who are working in independent games often don't know as much about open source as they probably should to get the best out of it. So I'd like to talk about how to talk to indies about open source. Now, what I'm not trying to do here is to get you, I'm not going to give you all the talking points you need so you can go and proselytize to uh, indie devs. But what I am going to do is talk about ways in which you can get the most out of your, um, most out of people who are using your software to maximize their engagement with your community. So, what I found is there's basically two kinds of open source communities in games. There's the ones populated by modders and there's the ones populated by existing professional game developers, and I, and I include indies in that. So by modders, I'm talking about usually amateur programmers who want to add a specific feature to a game they're a big fan of. So you know, this, is, this is people like uh, people who mod Skyrim or people who mod you know, uh, Fallout, and those kinds of games. People who just want to add a single thing. Um, the other side of that is game developers, people who know about open source but probably don't really have time to think about it that much. Um, so, there are games with, and, I, and in air quotes, open source communities. So this is games like Gary's Mod, Kerbal Space Program, which we talked about earlier today. Uh, Roblox is a massive one, and I might talk a bit more about that, that later on. Skyrim 4, and also an interesting one, Hearthstone. You can't mod Hearthstone, but what you can do is you can reverse engineer it. And so uh, we have a huge number of teams of uh, people uh, working together to analyze the communication between the Hearthstone client and the servers to the point where they can actually simulate full Hearthstone games offline without talking to the server at full speed because they're trying to build AIs. So that's kind of cool. Now, open source in these modding communities um, tends to feature these things. Usually, there are no licenses involved. People will share their code and they won't realize that a lack of a license doesn't actually permit them to do anything other than to maybe download a copy for themselves and, and th that's it. Um, just the implied license of, of here is a thing, you may download it. Um, so any license that uh, might appear uh, is often viewed with, with suspicion because they view it as a potential impediment to users grabbing their code and, and, or grabbing their product. They go, I don't want to put a license on that. I want, people to, I want everyone to be able to use it. And everyone goes, yeah, anyone who knows about licensing will go, well, yes, that, that will let anyone use it. You're actually letting people use it less by not having a license. And they go, that makes no sense. And th they're right. Um, but, yeah. Usually, there's not a huge amount of code sharing between these people. Um, uh, any that, that, so if there is code sharing, it usually takes place on pastebin. Um, <laughs> we see... Um, a lot of tags uh, attached to them. Like people will post a mod and then say, no commercial use. They won't define what that means, just they don't want people making money off of it. Or like, no re redistribution. Don't, don't, don't be the one to like, share mine. I'm, and this is a really strong sense of personal ownership. This is my mod. Um, you shouldn't try and change it. This is my creation. This is my work of art. 
Now, every single one of these is a totally reasonable thing for people who do not have a huge amount of experience working in software in larger teams. If you look at this list of things and think of it as a single person who has just gotten into programming, every single one of these things is something that is a reasonable, a reasonable uh, thing to think. So we have this extreme view of personal responsibility, personal uh, ownership of stuff. Um, actually, the word extreme is, is not really quite fair, but we have a really strong view that, like, I made this thing. All right, that's modders. Now, I want to emphasize that none of that was meant to be derogatory. I have extreme respect for people who put together uh, uh, teams on their own, often without any, any kind of support. My, mo my, my main point there is that uh, they just don't know about the kinds of things that, that we know. So, let's look at open source as done by games developers themselves. Generally, these are professional programmers, um, or they are um, you know, the pro-amateur band of people. Um, they very rarely build a thing that can be released. They very rarely build a library that they can put up on, on GitHub, except when the teams are very, very large, and organization by modules is the only way that they can operate internally, let alone externally. Any code releases that they do are frequently the entire game, usually when the game is no longer profitable to sell. So they just go, you know, we, we talked about uh, the GPL release of id Tech. That's an, a, a perfect example. Uh, id was not really making like, a huge amount of money off of licensing the Quake 1 engine anymore, although I do understand that Quake 1 is still a bit of a moneymaker for, for uh, Bethesda still. People are still buying it. Um, but at that point, like, it, people are still going to buy the game even if the game uh, engine is, is GPL'd. Independent developers are the busiest people you'll ever find because they aren't yet making the squillions of dollars they need to you know, finance their enormous startup offices. So they're often doing this as a side project, which means they have even less time than you. They are also often required to be multiply skilled. They aren't just programmers, and therefore they are divided in terms of their attention between programming and, and all the other things you have to do to make a video game. That means they barely have time for their own games, let alone any open source project. They're very frequently working alone as well. Now, when a game developer is aware of open source, they rarely sit down to just make some contributions. They, they very rarely go, hmm, um, here's a cool open source project. I shall sit down and work on it. What we typically see, or rather what I have typically seen, is pa the patches that do come into your project are almost always uh, personal itch scratches. They are features that they wanted to see, and so they wrote them, and they went, oh, yeah, cool, I can actually send in a pull request. So that's you know, use useful. But one thing that I've also noticed is that game developers are often not used to sending in code. They often don't even, like, the thought doesn't really occur to them that somebody else might want the thing that they, that they have uh, worked on. Um, these people, though, just on the, on the bright side for us as uh, people who often work in open source, is indies are often people who use Git, and they're often quite familiar with GitHub. Um, they usually don't often add licenses to their Git repos, despite in, uh, GitHub's um, uh, best of efforts in uh, encouraging that. But also a thing that's worth knowing is that in terms of AAA studios, so very, very large uh, uh, teams with lots of money behind them, they frequently don't use Git or Mercurial at all. Usually they're using Subversion or Perforce. Um, and uh, raise your hand if you've ever used Perforce. Yeah, like a few, a few. Like, yeah, and like and Perforce is amazing for the kinds of t uh, kinds of tasks that we see in um, game development because it's really really good at um, working with large binary files that change quite often. You can lock a file, which is you know anathema to Git. Um, it's all, all, all kinds of features like that. So what that typically means is that a, a studio may often just branch your code and then now it's in their SVN repo or it's their Perforce repo and now there's no, no real way for it to get merged back in. Like they can't set a pull request, the concept doesn't apply. So to make things easier for game developers in open source, make it very easy to adopt your library but also make it very, very uh, clear that you are willing to accept contributions just to plant that seed. Also make it very easy to accept contributions. So. I have a few tips and tricks on just how to release code as uh, when you are a developer yourself. You, you are building a, a, a system, you think, this is work uh, as open source, and I'll just toss it over the fence. Here's ways to reduce the impact of that open sourcing on your game. 
You should release a quick start tutorial as much as you can. Give people something to work with the moment that they download their, uh, their code. Have screenshots. This is critical. Even if it's a text-only library, have screenshots of the text. You know, have an animated GIF of you in a console. Have something visible, visual. Provide reference code. This reference code will be the only code that they use from your, uh, uh, from your library besides the, uh, the, um, the binary itself. Um, it will be copied and pasted everywhere, and people will base their entire games off the reference code. So make it pretty good as well. Nobody will want to update to a newer version of your open source project because they'll be terrified of that upgrade breaking their game. So design around that. The standard things, have a contributor's guide, have a code of conduct, but also, as I said before, go beyond the standard community management stuff. Make it very, very clear that you want contributions because a lot of developers don't realize this. When people do send in contributions, you should accept the very first contribution that people make, even if it's bad. Now, the reason why I'm saying accept even bad stuff is you're allowed to add commits that make it not bad before you merge into mainline. But the act of accepting the very first contribution is one that sets up this feeling in a new con uh, contributor uh, of, wow, this is a place where I'm accepted, where my ideas are accepted, I'll contribute more, and they'll act as evangelists for your project as well. Give people permission as well. Give them write access. Give them admin access. What are they going to do? It's a, it's a GitHub project that you maybe spend a few hours on, and then you're thinking, OK, OK open source. There's no benefit to maintaining an iron fist of control over the project. You're busy working on your video game. Give people admin access if you think that they would do a go, an OK job with this. Trust people with permission on your project. That's the single thing that I uh, have found minimizes the amount of impact that uh, open sourcing Jan Spinner has had on my game development. Because if you don't give somebody else at least some responsibility or at least some permission to exercise res uh, responsibility, then the project will just wither and die without any kind of input from anyone because you're not there anymore because you're busy working on your game. In our experience, we actually uh, accepted basically every pull request that came in um, and we granted admin access uh, aggressively to people who turn up a lot. We asked them permission first, of course, and they were often thrilled because they went, wow, but this is your code. You know, it's everyone's code now. Um, one thing that happened that's very cool as a direct result of all of this is that uh, Capybara Games um, uh, started using uh, Jan Spinner. Actually, as I mentioned, they forked it in the, in the SVN, so you know, maybe we'll see a merge, but I'm not really holding out a massive amount of hope, but you know, it's good for them. Um, so Cappy uh, is a studio that made a game, uh, made a few games. One of them is Super Time Force, um, which was a really awesome game. Another one was um, uh, Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery, which was really, really fun. And they uh, announced a partnership with, uh, with Cartoon Network. Um, so they're launching in a couple of days' time now, actually, OKKO OK Let's Play Heroes. Um, which is a tie-in to an amazing um, cartoon, and it's running code that I wrote for a cartoon game about emotional animals having trouble in economic times. <laughs> <laughs> so, for more information about uh, uh, these things, um, that link again for Yarn Spinner is lab.2 slash Yarn Spinner, and also uh, our site is secretlab.com.au. Thank you very much. <laughs> How are we for time, Tim? Oh, okay, cool. Um, so um, I'm open for questions. At the back. Um, so you've uh, taken the first uh, commit regardless of the fantastic idea. I've tried to look at it myself. But the corollary to that is if they've been enthusiastic, you, what's the process of onboarding them to be novel programs? So the question was um, accepting the, the, uh, the first commit, even if it's bad, is a great idea. But how do you then? Uh, onboard them into becoming a not bad programmer. Um, really, this is a question of mentoring. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, GitHub's um, code review system, which is really quite good because you can add comments to their code. You can explain why this bit of their function was not the best or why this doesn't match with um, the style of the rest of the code surrounding it. You can basically give them the, the, the information in the context of their original contribution. That can often be enough. Um, then, when they send in an, another commit and it's bad in the same ways, then you can just point to the, to, to the original comments. If it's bad in different ways, then 
it, really, you can. It, it's up to you to determine how much time you want to give to something else. But yeah, it, it, and that's going to be a case by case basis thing. But make use of the review tools that are available to you as part of the tool set. That's my main answer to that. Cool. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, so the question was, uh, what, what, what are my thoughts on the proliferation of different kinds of, uh, different kinds of text formats for uh, inter interactive fiction like Twine or Tracery and the fact that none of them really have a common kind of communication between them or people aren't really using them in the same projects and things like that. Um, I don't really see it as a problem. Um, I mean, the communication thing, I've, uh, of course, that's a thing that, that is always going to be a thing that, that should be improved. Right. Oh, I see. So I see. So much content. You're, con kind of, you're, you're, tied into this you're concerned about lock into a format. Um, I mean, this is not a problem that's unique to to uh, to interactive fiction. Really, this is you know any kind of library uh, that you use is going to have this kind of problem. I think that. Um, Honestly, if we encourage more people to be sharing their, both their libraries and also their complete games with each other, then we just create a, a much better sense of cross-pollination between projects. Um, yeah, that, that problem is a much bigger one than I think we probably have the scope to, uh, to talk about today. But uh, yeah, I don't really have a great solution to that, unfortunately. Um, all I can say is I'm really, gr I'm really, really glad that uh, the project that you did mention, which uh, uh, Twine and Tracery, they are open source. And you can look at what they do. There is a huge community of people working on them. For example, um, uh, Twine has the Twinery, where, so a, a, an enormous um, uh, collection of, thing, of uh, finished games you can read through, and a Tracery as well. There's a cheap bot done quick, which has a button that you can press to look at the source code of a Tracery written bot, um, which is honestly amazing. And also the fact that uh, uh, Kate Compton, who wrote Tracery um, and did a lot of work for Google, then ended up open sourcing everything she did for that as well. So, yeah, really, this is going to sound really pat at an open source conference, but more open source is good. <laughs> All right. Other questions? Yeah, Tim. Roughly how much text does, like, Jan's going to have to handle in Night in the Woods? How much text does Jan's going to have to handle in Night in the Woods? Well, we have, and I'm going entirely off, me uh, off memory here, but I did a word count of uh, uh, not counting the control flow. There's about... 440,000 words uh, in Night in the Woods, and that's an enormous amount. Um, one thing that we are not super proud of in the... I'm not super proud of because I wrote the Kabbalah, is that uh, it actually recompiles the, the, the source every time you launch... A, uh, you go into a level. So most of the game's loading time is actually compiling yarn source, and that's the thing that, like, that's, that was never changed, so that... That's you know that's shipped on PlayStation and Xbox and it's going to ship on Switch. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, lots is basically the answer there. There's a, an enormous amount of text in Night in the Woods. Is it all dialogue? One more time. Is it all dialogue? Is it all dialogue? Um, no, in fact, we have uh, so about I would say about an eighth of all the uh, of all the code written in Yarn for Night in the Woods is uh, is control stuff. So that's managing the state of the game. We also have stuff like there's stuff that I wouldn't consider to be uh, dialogue. Like the opening of the game begins with an interactive poem, and that's also written as a conversation that you choose items from. It's just rendered in a different way. But uh, yeah, and anything that oh, and also. Yarn is also used as a, uh, as a tool for containing large amounts of text as well. There's a sequence in the game where you go to a library and you look at newspaper articles. And uh, all the text for that is stored in Yarn as well. So we actually ended up having to build a system for uh, asking Yarn, hey, give me just the raw, uncompiled text of this because I'm going to show it to you. And so centralizing all that text into one system uh, worked quite well for us there. Yeah. Cool. Question. Me, I am working on the um, on the uh, iOS port of Night in the Woods, um, which is very exciting. 
Um, and I'm also working on a couple of internal titles at Secret Lab that um, we'll, uh, we will have more news to share about those when we have news to share about them. Um, plus, of course, I'm also working on a couple of books of, uh, for O'Reilly. I'm working on a book, um, uh, working on a, a book that's going to be going, going to press very, very soon, which is a, a general uh, iOS Swift programming thing, which is uh, everyone here should learn Swift. It's a wonderful language, and it also it's open source, um, as well as a couple of cookbooks on game dev, uh, one for iOS and also one for Unity. So um, we're doing some really cool stuff there. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? No? no cool. If there's no other questions, please join me in thanking John.